Hello and welcome to Music Works, the podcast that explores the classical music industry. In 2016, the film Florence Foster Jenkins, covering the life of the eponymous New York heiress and would-be singer, was released to positive reviews and an equally warm reception from the film going public. The writer was credited as Nicholas Martin, who, the same year, began a preemptive legal action against his former partner, the soprano Julia Cogan, to prevent her claiming any share of the creative input. The resulting court case went through three trials in which it redefined English law on joint authorship and finally, in January this year, found Julia Cogan to be joint author with a 20% share of credit for the screenplay. It was, however, something of a Pyrrhic victory for her in which the final trial judge preferred the testimony of Nicholas Martin in the face of what seemed compelling evidence in support of Julia's case for equal recognition. In this episode, we hear Julia describe the roller coaster of personal tragedy and triumph in the face of betrayal, a near fatal car crash, the trauma of years of tortuous legal action as she fought to establish her right to have her creative contribution to the movie recognised, her thoughts on how her gender played a significant part in both her own actions and the views of the court, and how she has emerged stronger, even more creative and determined to build an enhanced career as a writer and publisher alongside her established name as a brilliant coloratura soprano. We make no apologies for the length of this episode. We are sure that, like us, you will be on the edge of your seats as Julia, a natural storyteller, takes you on an extraordinary journey through the machinations of the Hollywood movie machine and the tortuous processes of the English legal system. But before we go to the studio where Julia is waiting to speak to Music Works, we bring you this message from our sponsor. Music Works is generously supported by Alliance Musical Insurance, the UK's number one musical instrument insurer serving the music community since 1960, proud to be the insurer of choice for over 70,000 musicians. Alliance offer a team of music experts who understand musicians' needs and lifestyles, especially helpful during the strange times we're in. You can get cover for all types of instruments and musical equipment. Cover includes protection against accidental damage, loss, theft and more. Also, unlike home insurance, there's no excess to pay on instrument or accessory claims. If these difficult times have shown us anything, it's that life can be unpredictable and a lot of things are beyond our control. That's why insurance is important for any musician, whether you're planning to tour the world or teach the next generation. Then, if the worst happens, you won't be left out of pocket and you can get back to doing what you do best. At the moment, Alliance have a special online offer with two free months cover. And not only that, but every Alliance music policy now includes free legal assistance and support so you can protect yourself both as a musician and in your personal life. Find out more at alliancemusic.co.uk. And so we take you over to the studio where Julia Cogan is waiting to speak to Music Works about Florence Foster Jenkins' The Movie and her fight for recognition. Hello, hi Julia and Margaret, thank you so much for joining me today. Hi Julia, Hello. lovely to see you. Hello. Welcome. So today we have uh, Julia Cogan um, here to talk to us about the landmark ruling on the Florence Foster Jenkins film script dispute, um, which was ruled recently. And we also have um, Margaret Pinder from the Polyphony Arts team to join us as well in this in this discussion um, because it's going to um, it's going to be a good one. I'm looking forward to this. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I'm usually in the back room, but I've been allowed out because I'm actually by training a solicitor, not um, intellectual property, but I've had a keen sort of professional interest in this case. So. Yes, absolutely. So, um, Julia, why don't we start by? Could you give us a summary of of um, of the situation? Well. Um, this is a cautionary tale above all else, but we're going to start with the good news. Uh, the good news, and this, this is good news uh, not just for me, it's good news for a lot of uh, collaborative creatives uh, out there. 
in the film world where the industry is very exploitative uh, by its by its very in its very nature. It's a very hierarchical industry, which I don't think will come as a surprise to anyone. And a great deal of power is concentrated in very few hands. And so, for example, if we were in America, uh, I I don't think I would have gotten very far at all proving my case because in America you are not entitled to credit just be, because you did the work, and it's it's quite a surreal if you think about what that means, what that concept means. It means someone can write something, another person can put their name on it, and that's legal. So you can have contracts that allow that to happen, and it happens all the time in Hollywood, um, which is, it's a very big problem uh, because you have a lot of, a lot of young writers or a lot of writers who are old but new to the profession or in short, people who, who don't wield a lot of power, but who wield a great deal of talent and uh, they are lambs to the slaughter uh, because to, to sell anything at all that they do, um, it, it's, it's very, very easy to eradicate their contribution from, from project while taking, uh, taking their, their uh, and appropriating their, their labors. So this is a landmark ruling that has actually uh, changed copyright law for the better it's redefined how collaborative work is seen by the courts, uh, especially in this country, which already, this already I should say that the UK and Europe was, uh, were a lot better than the US in that here, if you've done the work, they must credit you. That's not optional. Uh, that's a fact. They, they must give you the appropriate credit. And what my uh, rulings, there have been three trials altogether. The first was in the IPEC courts, the intellectual property courts. Um, in that first trial, we presented our case and there was a cross-examination and the judge found both of us to be honest, which was quite a feat considering we, our version of what happened could not have been more different. So one of us had to be lying essentially. Uh, Nicholas Martin claimed that he wrote the script alone and that I, as his girlfriend, provided nothing more than emotional support in some bits of singer's jargon that he could have gotten from anywhere. So that was one version of events. My version of events was that Florence Foster Jenkins was uh, a film uh, that I came up with in terms of the idea, though having said that, at the time that I was pitching him this idea, which was quite a desperate time in our lives, I was horribly injured after uh, a near fatal car accident. And so my singing career was at a low ebb. I was in and out of hospital uh, for operations. Uh, Nicholas Martin had just lost his job writing for Midsummer Murders and all his previous projects had done the industry rounds and nobody wanted anything he had written and there was no work coming for him in the future. So while we were brainstorming, money was running out, uh, we were quite desperate. <laughs> and, and I must say that this is the least original idea I've ever had in my creative life, because when I started teaching him new ideas, this was the first thing that came up. I'd known about the story of Florence Foster Jenkins since I was about 19 years old, and I, I remember the exact day that I learned about her story, I was in the music building uh, of the conservatory of my university in America, and I was walking down the corridor. We had a long corridor, and one of my singer friends, a countertenor, was sitting on the floor, and he had a boombox between his legs, and it was blaring out Florence Foster Jenkins singing the Queen of the Night aria her infamous rendition of the Queen of the Night, the second Queen of the Night, and he was singing along with her uh, in a kind of competition. Um, and I just, how it was, it just had to be one of the funniest things I'd ever heard. And of course I, I demanded on the spot to know what it was that he was listening to. And I ran to the library and I immediately checked out a recording of her 
as as it was released uh and, and quite extraordinarily her recording went viral and it was re-released over and over again by melatonin and then rca and it was called the glory multiple question marks of the human voice uh, and at the time i was this was all the repertoire the coloratura soprano that i was struggling with uh horribly technically it's the most difficult pieces you could you could ever find and so it was it was uh, really such such a comfort to me it really was better than a coaching and, and a psychotherapy session rolled into one to listen to her and when i was at the end of my tether uh with my own technical studies uh, i would listen to her and i would lighten up a little bit uh and also you know get a reinforced uh, desire to conquer these difficulties so i wouldn't sound so ridiculous so this was a story that was for many many years <laughs> much many years later when i was regularly singing at carnegie hall well, regularly I, i sung in the two smaller halls three times uh over a period of a few years and i stayed in a building on the upper west side of new york where lily pons uh had there was a portrait of lily pons recording on the wall uh and so these were all characters that i i'd been thinking about for quite some time and in fact uh, a singer friend of mine singer pianist friend had been in uh Stephen Temperley's play Souvenir on and off Broadway and he had had the idea so shortly before I met Nicholas Martin and gotten into my car crash um he had the idea of bringing the play in a French version to Paris and because I was francophone he thought I should be involved playing one of the characters and so that was on my mind when I met Nicholas Martin to make a long story short i pitched him the idea and it took me weeks to convince him to start working on the story um and his point which was quite a valid point is it's all good and well listening to her sing for 5 minutes but how do you create a feature film around the story of an old woman who sings badly in the same way over and over and over again how do you how do you build the tension of that and to me the story the framing of the story uh really was about the insanity of the world that supported this this hoax uh she became a legend in her own time while being completely unaware that she was the queen of comedy uh not of classical singing as she had she had imagined and so there were a lot of people who benefited from from this uh, starting with her pseudo husband uh, Bayfield uh, St. Clair Uh, and so a lot of people were were sponging off of her and, and it was it, it was it was really that the oxymoron of the world's worst singer selling out Carnegie Hall in under 2 hours and becoming a recording legend that that I uh really loved and I I got my way in the end uh we started work on it and I wound up over the next uh, few years we were together for a total of 3 years and um we moved in together I guess half a year after we met something like that and we started work very quickly on this uh and many other projects and here i'm going to interject a fact that the courts have chosen to ignore and this will sort of give you a, a taster of how legal logic differs from the normal sort um i imagined <laughs> in my naive way that when you go to court the court's objective is to get to the bottom of things to understand what happened. Um so I came to the court and I said look uh the evidence the weak point of my case and my case was that we not only collaborated on the idea but on every aspect of the writing of the script. Uh, uh the dialogue, the characters, the plot, you name it, I was there uh and I described at length how we worked and there was no because we were life partners there was no separation between our personal life our private life and our work life but the salient fact was that because i worked on nick martin's computers which were already uh equipped with final draft software which is the standard industry screenwriting software they use which is quite expensive i never bothered buying the software and installing it on my computer because it that that just seemed a a crazy expenditure that nobody needed um 
which wouldn't have been very practical anyway, because we were working on the same computer when we were working together. And he would often go off and write on his own for some hours, and then I would come back to it and do the rewrites, and, and we would discuss it all. Uh, but because breakfast was work and walks were work, and it, you know, it all bled into each other. Um, the only real evidence that I had of my distinct contribution from his uh, were during times when one of us traveled. And generally, I was the one who traveled. And thank God, <laughs> early on in this process, I went to visit my younger son, Sammy, who was staying with my parents in Florida for his year of high school abroad in America. He had watched too much television and really wanted the American high school experience in Florida. And my newly retired parents had bought a little flat on the beach in Clearwater. And I, uh, as soon as my last surgery after the car crash allowed, I got on a plane and I went out uh, and spent some weeks sharing a small twin room with my son. And this lack of privacy meant that we couldn't always speak over Skype um, and we had to type. And a great deal of my case on Florence Foster Jenkins exists just from those documents. And at that point we were, we were thrashing out the story, we were uh, looking at the characters and the, it was the treatment phase where you do an outline of who, what, where, why, and, and, and where the script is going. And uh, that, that was the case for that project. And then I was, I was home most of the time when we actually wrote uh, the, the first three drafts of the script. Uh, after that, we had Pathé and Corky Films and bought the script, and it actually changed surprisingly little from draft three to draft nine, which was the final published script. And so uh, I came to the court with what seemed to be a slam dunk, which is that, well, we worked on some dozen projects when we were together as a couple. Four of those dozen projects were our own new co-creations. So projects that didn't exist uh, before we started uh, coming up with them. Others were a combination of old projects that Nick had and projects that came in from external sources that he was pitched and working with other producers he'd known and all that kind of thing. Uh, and so if, if I took all the written evidence of our collaboration across all those projects, there was heaps of it. There was heaps of it. And it showed every kind of contribution and what's more, on one of our projects that we started pretty much contemporaneously with Florence, it was the story Nick actually came up with the idea of writing up our own accident-prone beginnings into uh, a romantic comedy. Because I, I was in this car crash on my way to a recording studio, incidentally, to, uh, to record a solo album um, several days after we met. And so uh, there were a lot of, of obviously knock on effects, uh, you know, in our dating life and in, in our whole early, early uh, relationship. And so when, uh, when we were working on this, this project, we had an argument that was really to shape my own uh, shocking behavior from that point on. I asked very early on, and this was weeks after I moved in with him, February 2012, um, I asked to have my name next to his on that project because this I did not think was a very controversial request. I mean, we were already spending most of our time working together on various projects. Um, it was absolutely obvious I was doing it with him, and this was the, our own story that we were working with. Um, and he became very angry with me. Uh, and said, no, firstly, there were, there were some things. Firstly, how dare I consider myself to be a writer? Um, I pointed out that I had studied English literature at university, that I'd been writing since early childhood. He said, well, I've been singing since early childhood. Said, Wait, if this is not a, you know, as so we have this kind of absurdist conversation uh, about it and he said, he gave me examples of relationships in his life that had failed because of an attempt at collaboration. And so I walked away from this conversation, uh, all, all mockery and all, it was, it, it was, it really foreshadowed our relationship as a whole. I mean, everything that went wrong in our relationship was present in that one argument. Um, 
I, of course, uh, was, was the master of positive spin and I walked away and the only thing I could retain was that he had been angry at me. And I thought, I'll show him how wonderful collaborating can be. Uh, and I, I walked away quite determined to make it uh, as, as lovely for him as possible and also not to step on his turf, not to, not to behave in a way that made him feel threatened. So from then on, I, uh, I was deferential in everything. I called everything his, even as I was coming up with projects. Uh, so there was another project, another new project that was contemporaneous with these two that we came up with. Um, and I, I was quite shocked when I was preparing for the legal case and I actually had to go back and look at the written evidence that we had. And this was another Skype chat. And even as I was coming up with the idea for this whole thing, I was calling it his. And I was saying to him, oh, it would be so wonderful for me to get to work with you on your, your project, the thing I had just invented. Um, and uh, this kind of behavior from me uh, made up a large part of the case against me, my own words. I said to him uh, that when we were working on Florence, I said, please ignore anything you like of what I say. This is totally your baby, uh, I said. Uh, and so all of this, the totally your baby was one of the main uh, bases upon which uh, the first high court judge uh, in the intellectual property court decided um, that I was not a co-author and that I, <laughs> you know, it was, it was basically claimed that I had handed over any, any proprietary ownership of, of that project to, to Nicholas Martin by, by talking like this. Um, and of course it got worse and worse, even at that early stage when he had the argument, you know, any sane person would have either stopped working with him or better yet moved out immediately because this is, this is ladies. <laughs> And gentlemen, this is not just, just women, this happens to uh, If anyone in your life does this, walk away right now. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> don't wait for tomorrow. Um, but I, I lived with it and I did anything I needed to do to stay in that relationship. And there was, you no, know, you, you, get, you get sucked in uh, in relationships because you give so much of yourself to them. And it's, it, there is this kind of downward spiral and it's, it's almost a hazing ritual in that you keep throwing in good money after bad, good love after bad, and, and because you think it's accumulating to something, you think intimacy is growing and that all of this is happening. And one of the things that allowed me to stay so entrenched and ensconced in this dynamic, in this completely insane dynamic I can see now, with the benefit of hindsight, was that at the time, Nicholas Martin was gushing with praise and gratitude. And I have, uh, from that same Skype chat in which we're creating uh, the, uh, the project that became Sumner Jackson, which was called Collaborators, long story. Um, it was about artists in occupied Paris and, and we were using a whorehouse as a location, all kinds of things like that. Um, one of the things that he said during that work session, and I have this in writing, uh, was, was he, he gushed in writing, he said, I love working with you. Your mind is so quick and full of fun. I feel so complete. So there was, again, this evidence which the courts refused to take into consideration. And in fact, in this third ruling, this was found to be burdensome, burdensome and unhelpful. I a quote unquote, a reference to other projects. Uh, and so this allowed this kind of version of event, events to build up in which I, I wasn't a writer. I was a girlfriend and I was a singer. Um, and in fact, the third judge, uh, basically to come to his conclusions, he used the, the tiny, tiny fraction of written evidence that we had from the Florence project, uh, over the years. Uh, and he came to the conclusion that I had lied. I had made up the rest of my story. So he decided that I never typed. The never typing was quite surreal because I had taken a secretarial course in school. So I detest writing by hand because I just type so much faster. And I typed very quickly from age 16 or whenever I took it. Um, and I would often, when we were working on the computers, Nick is dyslexic. Uh, and it just made no sense for him to sit there and type laboriously uh, as we both shot 
ideas and lines back and forth. So I would often shoo him off the, the computer and obviously I would, I would take over because I could type as quickly as we talked. And so I, it was decided that I, uh, I couldn't type because, uh, and again, one of the basis upon which I was found to be a liar was that I had claimed, so there was uh, there were legal proceedings, there was a claim uh, that obviously never went to court uh, after my car crash. Uh, I was in the passenger seat, it was the, uh, the, the fault of the other driver, they took all responsibility, they came into oncoming traffic. Uh, my left hand broke from a whip injury, so all these bones uh, are, are plated with metal. And uh, in my witness statement from, from that time, uh, I say that I, I have trouble playing the piano for long. The judge decided that this, this was a contradiction uh, between me typing. So it was claimed by the other side's legal team that I couldn't type. And I said to the judge in, from the witness box, well, but we know we, I could type uh, because you have these Skype chats and you can see that I type much quicker than Nick Martin. You've got the timings right there. But the judge decided I was dishonest because he found there to be a contradiction between my claim that I couldn't play the piano for long and type, even though the whole medical assessment was done by medical professionals and I, I couldn't have lied about it or exaggerated had I even wanted to, you, you know. So it, this is the kind of logic that you're exposed to in the witness box. And it's, it's quite surreal to be sitting there. Um, so this, this case has been ongoing for much of the past six years. And after that first trial where the judge found me to be honest, Nicholas Martin to be honest, uh, but he refused to read my witness statement. He refused to read the evidence. And in order to try to prove my case, I, I created a document uh, which is quite long uh, and, and very boring that went through the development process of the Florence Foster Jenkins script from first iteration to last. Um, and I wasn't around for the last two months of development. Um, the, the, the changes were very, very slight at that point. Uh, but I wrote this document and I, uh, you know, I went through all the discarded openings of the script and, and on and on and on. And, and it really was not a very pleasant read. Uh, and the judge refused to read it. Um, and this allowed us to appeal. Uh, he also made many mistakes on European law, which, which was the law of the land here, regarding collaborative copyright. So the law as it stood and as it stands is actually quite simple. You, you have to, to, to be considered a collaborator, uh, a co-author of, of a creative work, you have to have contributed something substantial, a substantial part of it and that part has to reflect your personality as a creative. Um, and that's, that's actually a fairly low threshold. And that original judge uh, refused to read the evidence. And he also refused to consider that threshold accurate, accurately. The, the Florence Foster Jenkins film, for those of you who, who've seen it, um, has uh, quite a few scenes where uh, musical lingo is deployed to comedic effect. And uh, not even Nicholas Martin disputed that that lingo came from me, it could only have come from me. Um, and so uh, my, my original barrister said, look, this is, this is just silly. We're going to go for the low hanging fruit. And I, I was adamant and passionately argued that we must argue this case in a collaborative context, which means we have to argue not just based on the idea that I'm an opera singer, there are scenes pertaining to opera, singer, opera singing that are quite specific and that therefore uh, that lingo is enough to make me a co-author, but we have to argue across the board that I studied English literature at university, uh, that I've been writing uh, forever and ever, and that we had worked on a, a dozen or so projects together uh, and we had all this evidence. Uh, so I was told that that was the wrong, the wrong way uh, to, to approach my case. Uh, and uh, this, this low hanging fruit approach is, is what prevailed in that first trial. And that made it possible for them to simply say, but this, this is just singer's lingo, this is just guff. 
just yeah. no, nothing at all. It's not, it's not uh, evidence of any kind of creative input. And that is what that first judge ruled. So we appealed to the appeal court on six grounds of law and fact, and all six were accepted by the appeal court. Now the appeal court uh, is a very different animal. There were three uh, highly reputed venerable judges uh, who sat, sat on that bench. Uh, unfortunately, the appeal court cannot make a final ruling on an int intellectual property case because they don't hear cross-examination, so they cannot find whether someone is lying or telling the truth. But their uh, ruling really is a landmark case in the history of intellectual property law because they opted to, to take the broader definition of uh, collaboration and collaborative law. Uh, than had been had been previously done, and they they looked at all the other uh, contributions that make up a film script beyond just uh, the text, the exact words used, uh, which which was uh, very very important. And they also clarified the power dynamic uh, of of the the profession by ruling that the ultimate arbiter test is not the defining test. So one of the things that was argued in court was that because Nicholas Martin could ignore what I said, he had the right to put what he wanted into the script. And I kept reiterating that, you know, do whatever you like, um, that he is the author uh, by virtue of, of being the mastermind of it, the person in control. And they ruled that no, that is not the case. What matters is your actual contribution to the final product. And so um, a very important ruling uh, and, and quite extraordinary because on the day of our appeal court trial, a brand new book by Dr. Daniela Simone, uh, a young uh, female professor of law at UCL came out and it was uh, about collaborative copyright and it already contained our case in it as one of the central examples of where the law goes wrong. And so uh, the judges used her new book uh, to issue their landmark ruling uh, that I hope will really open the, the floodgates for, for previously abused and ignored uh, collaborators. Uh, but, um, th so the last thing about this, uh, the appeal court was that one of the judges hailed from the high court of the family division, the family court division, and he immediately picked up, Judge Peter Jackson immediately picked up, I, I had the impression from the comments he made, one of them being, it, as, as it was being argued that I was just uh, merely a supportive spouse, uh, not that I wasn't, we weren't married, I should say, uh, a supportive partner, um, that he, he said, but surely this doesn't this doesn't include her doing his work for him. Uh, and so I could see that he, he got the coercive relationship end of it right. And that's crucial to understanding why I behaved as I did, why I, in my own diary, wrote and finishes flow after we had spent the weekend finishing the first draft of the script. Um, why somebody would do that. Uh, so that was a decision uh, that was that was quite good. And the case was, to my shock and horror, passed back to into the clutches of the intellectual property court for the third and final trial, uh, which happened uh, this this just a few months ago. And the decision from that came down uh, in January last month. And there's been quite uh, quite a strong reaction to it. The third and last judge, uh, who is a quasi-professional poker player, uh, is is a judge who who had actually worked with my barristers in their chamber, and they were uh, hugely admiring of his intellectual capacity, uh, of his work ethic, of his uh, of, of his professionalism, of his uh, kindness, and all all the rest. And so I had great expectations. This, this was by far the most painful thing for me uh, because he was perched on the 
in, uh, in the judge's box uh, above us uh, and looking down into the witness box, you know, kind of eagle-eyed with a kind of cocked uh, eyebrow, uh, looking down as, in, you know, a kind of godlike presence. Uh, and I, I went second. I, I, I was in the witness box for five hours on Friday the 13th. Um, <laughs> Truly living up to its ghastly, ghostly, uh, ghoulish reputation. Um, and Nicholas Martin had spent uh, most of the day on the witness stand the day before. And I felt that he performed brilliantly, by which I mean he revealed his personality absolutely perfectly uh, to the court and all who were present. Um, he argued that I, under oath, he swore that I had not written one word of that script. Uh, he, when he questioned about whether or not I had, I had ever come into his office to work, he said I had never, absolutely not ever been in the office, I was elsewhere, he said she was in the kitchen, um, I don't know, in the kitchen, <laughs> he said, and it was, it was full of the kind of, uh, well, not only pathological lying, but of the kind of just shocking misogyny that you know, I watched my uh, female barrister, team of barristers just kind of swoon at the desk because you, you, you know, even, even saying it aloud, you, you just hear how awful, awful that sounds. Um, and, and I never, gosh, I just um, never expected, I never thought it was possible in this world or any other that the judge would not believe me. Uh, and he didn't, uh, he did not believe anything I said, uh, despite ruling, in my favor uh, on the main points, namely that I am indeed a co-author because he felt that this particular script was so imbued with musical characterization, which I tried to explain. It's very unusual, the Florence Foster Jenkins script. Uh, most of the time, if you have music in a film, it accompanies the action. Uh, it's not an integral part of it, and it's certainly not an integral part of the psychological makeup of the characters or uh, the motivation um, or, or, or the, the, even the development of the plot or anything like that. So this script is quite, the only script like it I know is the one I wrote after that. And that also does that, a completely different story. Uh, but based on that and based on the, the little snippets uh, of written proof that we have from the Florence Project and all those early treatment drafts that we worked on when I was in Florida, uh, he felt that I was a 20% co-author while feeling that everything else that I claimed, which was that I was typing, I was working on dialogue, I was working uh, virtually every day with him on the script, he ruled to be a lie. Um, and that, when, when we got the preliminary judgment, that's all I could see. I couldn't even see the good news, and my legal team thought I'd lost my marbles, but I was so devastated over Christmas. Uh, because uh, when you're in this kind of situation, more than anything else in the world, you want to be believed because <laughs> it's just something that happens. That someone essentially rewrites your identity. And I don't think anyone who knows me for longer than five minutes uh, would think I, I don't write or I don't know. It's just it's been such a fundamental part of, of me for, for so long uh, that I, I just couldn't believe such a flagrant lie uh, could, could float uh, and be picked up by the press and the articles that came out uh, about me and, and this kind of, the Times really outdid themselves. The Times in 2016 published a, I think pretty much a full page spread on their second or third page. And um, they'd gone on my website and they'd taken a photograph of me in Queen of the Night, full Queen of the Night regalia in the middle of performing the second Queen of the night aria and I had in that production I had huge long nails and I was holding a dagger and it was dead head and and I'm screaming you know, my, my face is like this and I'm wearing a huge wig and I'm you know it's all like that and uh they that was the photograph that they used uh to to talk about the, the case um which was extraordinary and they also in quotations, they, they pretended that an, an interview had taken place that had never taken place. And they put Nicholas Martin's particulars of claim from the case into quotation marks next to my name. They claimed I said things that were part of his particulars of claim. Yeah. And I, when that happened, I pulled out their code of conduct. 
And I wrote to the editors of the Times, <laughs> quoting their code of conduct at them. Uh, because again, you know, we don't live in the Democratic Republic of Iran. This is the UK. Uh, I never imagined anything like that could happen here. It, it really is Rita Skeeter, you know, it's straight out of Harry Potter. It's just quite surreal. And so uh, several months later, I get a retraction and they said, ah, on the online version of the article, they had published a correction that you needed a, a you know, a magnifying glass to see at the bottom of this, you know, months after the original article came out. So uh, just absolutely shocking. And I thought I never, I never really liked to talk about identity politics, the men versus women. And I, you know, I, I'm the mother of two sons and I love men, I've, except for Nicholas Martin, I've been immensely lucky in my life. Thank God, touch wood. Um, but I just couldn't picture a world in which a man with a similar background to mine would have been painted as the vindictive, lying boyfriend of the real creative uh, who was trying to somehow, you know, greedy and it's just um, shocking. <laughs> That's absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing about this case is there are so many different aspects to it because there's the legal side of it and then there's the factual side of it and then there's the as you say the kind of gender politics of it yes you know it was a constant s stream of kind of good news bad news good news bad news good news bad news as you yeah. say in the first instance the good news you were believed the bad news was the finding on law was incorrect That's, yes so then it went for a finding on law which reversed that incorrect you know, I think it's the InfoPAT case, isn't it, as the level of... It's InfoPAT. You know, exactly. It's InfoPAT, the, the, the test that should be used, and it unpacked that more, um, which is really good news for yes. creative, collaborative creatives. It said it's not just about who's written it. You can't just look at the writing. You've got to look at all the contributions, especially if it's, say, a drama or a screenplay, characterisation. Um, and obviously, that's where, as you say, the musical aspects, there were scenes they particularly mentioned, like the when they auditioned the accompanist, that scene, the fact that he played the swan, you know, sounds like the swan, the lily pond scene, and all those sort of decisions yeah. worked in your favor. So yeah. that looks like great news, but then of course, as you say, and interesting, I thought that was interesting that the family law judge yeah. could see the dynamic. He knew exactly what that guy was up to. He obviously spotted but yeah. unfortunately, yeah. he wasn't then in the position That's right. to find on the facts of it. But he saw, you know, you've got a certain amount of, you know, I know it's a kind of pyrrhic victory, but somebody, a senior judge, did spot what was going on. Unfortunately, as you say, it then came back to the third hearing, which when the law had been decided, when, to my mind, it, you know, it was all looking good. The finding on law was in your favour on collaboration. Yeah. So then it came down to basically fundamentally fact. Yeah. Um, and I mean, the, the judgment is 73 pages long. I do recommend it to everybody um, <laughs> to make it your close bedtime study. But actually, you know, the, the gist of it is in the kind of opening sort of summing up. A lot of that is in there, um, especially it sets out the definition of how collaborative, yeah. um, uh, you know, how that's defined and how it should be assessed. Um, and the difference between writing and skills, but, you know, yeah. it's not the person who necessarily brings the writing. But then, of course, it just came down to what evidence was believed. And it just seems to me that there were hugely sexist elements there. And as you say, if you turn the roles round, how plausible would that be? You know, would well, you have so good? I mean, it's, it's really possible. just yeah. absolutely, you know, reading it, I mean, the, you, don't, you don't usually, not since the great Lord Denning, retired and you know have you got judgments that tend to have you reading them on the edge of your seat sick thinking god damn it <laughs> well i you know even when i was in the depth of despair after we got the preliminary judgment just two days before christmas i i my writer's brain is going this is great he has just given me such inadvertently he's gifted me a story that's much better than a correct finding would have been. Uh, because oh, yeah, I've, I've been thinking that. Because, <laughs> yeah. Julia, we, we've had these, because I'm a published writer as well, and I'm thinking, 
There's another script in this. This is definitely a script in this. <laughs> so, I mean, in the, in the end, in one way, it was kind of like good news, bad news again. Good news, you were recognised. Yes. You were, but only up to 20%, only to the extent of 20%. Yes. And also, they didn't, I think they didn't find that the film companies owed you anything because that, they was, that was really, oh, that, that hurts. That hurts. The, 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 comp he, so the film, so Nicholas Martin was found, was, was absolved of all dishonesty. And the film companies, uh, possibly almost as shocking, uh, were absolved of any wrongdoing. And it was claimed, quote unquote, that the reason that they released the film without my name on it, without paying me or crediting me for anything, even though they worked at length with me directly on that script, it was my fault. My, her own fault was what the judge wrote in that ruling. Yeah, they um, tried to argue a stop, it's a, it's a legal doctrine as in, you know, you're a stop from trying to make that claim. And I just read it, I was like, what? Yes. But it, it flew. Well, was, I, would never, I would never have tried to stop. I was, I was very, very conscious and very worried that uh, any kind of legal um, wrangling would, would affect the script. And it, it was, in fact, Nicholas Martin who sued me preemptively. I, I didn't sue him. Uh, I was actually... <laughs> I, I think that's one of the most interesting aspects of it, actually. I've yeah. assumed it was you bringing the action. It's hilarious. It's funny. I mean, you, you've got to laugh. I, I mean, eventually, I, I will wake up one day and think that this whole thing is hilarious. But he actually sued me preemptively uh, to, to keep me from doing anything. But I, I would never have tried to stop the film. I would never have, have tried. So I asserted my rights before filming uh, uh, before the film was ever ever released, um, so they absolutely could have fixed this at the drop of a pin. Uh, and what's more, I wasn't trying to. I, I didn't even know what I was entitled to, and I didn't really care. What I wanted was the smallest, a share of the smallest kind of writing credit in existence, so I could keep writing. Because by this time, I'd always known I was going to write professionally, but I, until I met Nick, had no idea I'd become a script writer. And, in particular, because that's a very, it's quite a, a distinct craft, if, if you will. You just kind of have to get the idea of the formula of it uh, from someplace to be able to do it. Uh, but at that point, I had done a, a radio feature for BBC Radio 4 that was chosen pick of the week, and I had a number of scripts in production, and I, I just loved because, and I think a lot of uh, actors, performers uh, who become writers will tell you, your time on stage, not a moment of it is wasted. You. You have a kind of visceral understanding of what makes dialogue interesting, what, how, you know, how to place people. It, it just becomes part of your bone marrow. And so when I started working on scripts in particular, uh, just sort of all, all the skills I've ever accumulated in life came out in that one stream. I was just born to do it. And it's, it's so much more fun than any other kind of writing. <laughs> so I just wanted the tiniest speck of credit and three pennies. Uh, to keep writing, I just wanted the credit that would allow me to send out my new work and to have people read it. And uh, the response was absolutely not. Uh, you, you can, nothing, you get nothing. Um, and, <laughs> and instead of getting anything at all, I was sued. I, I had papers delivered to me by courier. Um, yeah. Well, that will teach you. I'm tired. <laughs> And do you feel so? As Margaret said, you, you know, we've um, there is this, there has been this constant sense of, of a small part of a win and, and a, a small part of a loss, or you know, good news, bad news throughout. How does it feel now? Do you feel vindicated and like you've got your result? Ah, uh, I I feel part. I think had the judge believed me, I would have felt absolutely vindicated. Um, that has has taken away uh, any any joy. Um, I, I really uh, could have could have felt because uh, and probably because I had such a high opinion of this judge as a human being and as a, and as a judge going into the the case I I'm not so wounded about the first judge for example that you know he found it was all just guff and well you know I, it doesn't have a, the kind of emotional impact but this this really really actually hurts. Um, because he was oh, talking to me yeah. for so long and he, he smiled at me at the end and I thought, why would you smile at me? You, 
you didn't believe anything I said. It's just really painful. Really for some stupid well, I was I was very surprised he basically just said, I'm not going to look at, you know, the other work they did together. That's not yeah. evidence I'm particularly yeah. interested in. I don't think it's relevant. And I found that quite extraordinary because, you know, it did, to me, that would have been clear evidence of a pattern of conduct and pattern of collaboration. So that was one point where I just thought, well, that's odd. I it, know, so why would you why would you do that? I don't know. If you were a person off the street and you say, well, you know, okay, someone has had a career as a singer and they they, they claim to have co-written a film. I said, well, well, have they written anything else? Is there anything else that shows that there was a collaboration? It's the first question you would ask uh, yeah. in a logical basis. And if you see there are, you know, the, the, the house is littered with scripts, uh, you think, well, come on, this is ridiculous. Oh, yeah, she studied English literature. Oh, yeah, she's got a whole bunch of projects that are, duh, it's a lie. But no, that, that yeah, is not yeah. how the court saw it. Yeah. That same particularly, I thought that was one of the most damaging things, yes. actually, to your arguments on fact, was that he was not willing to consider that evidence. Absolutely. I think that was, that was quite crucial, yes. actually. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I'm also struck by how frustrating it must have been. I mean, I don't know... To have a judge in the second trial in the in the court of appeal that understood the yeah. um, the impact of the coercive relationship and the way that um, that you were treated and the way that that resulted in you behaving, I don't know. As you were telling the story, I wasn't sure whether that obviously it was it was blindingly clear to me, but I wasn't sure whether that was going to come into the court case at all. And then when it did, I was like, great. And then when it didn't, again at the end, you know. <laughs> That's very disappointing, having having encountered somebody within that who's able to recognise that, and then for it for it actually not to kind of be part of the um, the culmination of the um, of the outcome. Well, I broke down completely on the in the witness box in this third trial. I just fell to pieces, um, and the judge did uh, to give him his due. Uh, he did find that Nicholas had been. Uh, I think the words he used were very controlling uh, towards her. Um, mm. So I I think. Uh, that does it does appear it just he doesn't he doesn't take it um, to its obvious uh, yeah so he's very controlling but that's kind of okay yeah <laughs> it's just as you say about when you're talking yeah. about the uh, trying to imagine how this could have been you know if the if the gender roles had been reversed how this mm -hmm. could have been seen um, I think manipulative behavior ha is is um, done by both men and women absolutely but th this is a very it is a, it is a male trait nonetheless in, in terms of we hear this kind of story all the time in that you know men behave like this and women behave and, and do the kinds of things that you did and I think that um, yeah. not having that understood and and recognized fully in the in the legal system has to have has to have a, a sexist element to it as well because it's you know it's, it's all the male perspective, isn't it? Absolutely. It's, it's fascinating because several days after uh, the press coverage, which is, has been incredible since the decision came down on the 11th of January, um, I was contacted by a pair of female documentary filmmakers who've been working for five months on a documentary about uncredited uh, creatives in a film. And they both of each of them had a similar story to tell. And uh, they were absolutely thrilled when they saw coverage of my case because there's no good news, you know, un until at least something positive has happened and things have, have moved along and I actually was, was found to be a co-author. Uh, and so we've been collaborating on what is now quickly becoming a, a documentary series uh, about all this. Now, and it's just collaborating with them. It's, it's just fascinating the difference. I mean, you just have to laugh. Uh, <laughs> It just would never occur to, to any of us that sharing diminishes you in some way. Why would it? Why would sharing anything? Uh, it's just. But to Nicholas, the to Nicholas Martin, I think I think the notion that he was not wholly responsible for his own success was just something he couldn't accept. It was crucially important. Because he'd been he'd been trying to have a film made for some twenty five years, it was a really long time that he had been, and he never he had never done it, he never managed it. And here was my first project. I I never worked on a film script before. It was very galling. It must must have 
irritated him to no end. And he was in, in our relationship, there was always a, uh, he was very thin skinned about the difference in our education levels. You know, Nicholas never got his A levels. I had a master's degree with, you know, perfect grades. And it was all, it was all this kind of, he didn't, I come from a family of people with doctorates. I'm one of the few people who doesn't have a doctorate. And all that it irritated the, the crap out of me. He kept saying, oh, you know, you're too highbrow for me. That was his his quote, you know, and I'd be reading Proust next day, I'd be watching, you know, the funniest home videos yeah, yeah. I love, by the way. That's a classic um, put down to women. I used to get that all the time. Oh, you're too clever for your own good. What does that even mean? I mean, what does that even mean? It's an, it, it, is, it, it is used against you in a funny, funny way. And, it, yeah. and I, it was very strange that he kept bringing it up because I didn't care that he didn't have his A-levels. I don't really give a toss what his family background was or I, I really I don't judge intelligence in that way at all or people in that way and I don't really I don't have a hierarchy or any of that um but to him it was very important and that just because he kept bringing it up I just felt that much more deferential to him like the need to cheer him up and, and raise him up and 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 bolster his ego as we worked was just that much greater as we went along because it, it was I, I felt that the need was was there constantly to to, to support him. Uh, to apologize was, for your own success. And, oh, uh, yeah, like he needed my, it was my intellectual confidence that irritated him, that I kind of, oh, he's just like, oh, you're too opinionated, you're too this, you're too, it's always that kind of, uh, that, yeah. that I, I... Oh yeah, Tokyo, women talk too much. Yeah, the head of the Olympics uh, in Japan, women talk too much in meetings. <laughs> Many a true yes. word. <laughs> Yeah. Verbose. My my first and, and, and greatest defender was Robert Pockdell uh, of Keystone Law. And I, I turned up at his office with a, a, a stack of, of printouts from all our projects, uh, you know, hundreds of pages of us working remotely on various things. Um, and, and he took he took on on the case and he's the only one who hasn't made a penny out of it. This has cost a fortune. And this is the perfect time to say that the most unusual thing about my case is that I had the means to fight it. And of course I didn't have the means. The man I'm now married to emptied his retirement account uh, for me to be able to do it. Uh, and uh, what an extraordinary thing to do for someone. Wow. But most people, you know, 99.9% .9 of, of people uh, in this country could never afford. No. How's uh, it looking on cost? Did you get, what was the... Do you know, we are still in the midst of massive legal wrangling on this and Nicholas Martin is still trying to strip me of my written by credit. He is petitioning the court to strip me of it um, to, and to to uh, to try and impose a lesser credit. So we already had a guy, we, we both petitioned the film company. Uh, they thought I should get a story by credit. I sent them the Writers Guild of Great Britain rules that made it very clear that that's not correct. They then uh, took my view of it and credited me with a written by, which is right. But now that's going to be brought before the judge in the costs hearing uh, that's mm. coming up. I don't think that's going to do him any favours. I mean, you yeah. only got 20% anyway. I mean, you know, enough already. Be, you know, he, I yeah, think he's, he, can he not see it's actually come out of this pretty well, actually. In ter I mean, in terms, practically speaking. Yeah. But it's it's about the ego. It's all about the well, yeah. All that. So it's uh, naughty. He, he won't let it lie, and so this this stress is ongoing. It's still very very frustrating. Uh, yeah. So definitely. But what about so? But going forward, I mean, yes. what are you you must have so much. So what are you doing? I, I, my idea is this should be in the Archers. The Archers is forever taking up. They did the coercive control. They're now doing you know human slavery i mean i think this is the next going to be the next big thing in ambridge you know i think that's that's where we should go but what are your projects now going forward so uh i've written uh, the pilot of um a, a television limited series which which i i really love um i i've written a feature film that i really love i uh, I'm in the middle of my memoir about all this and it it is uh it's called never meeting Meryl Streep um and uh it's it, it's it is comedic um just because the the unintentional comedy of this has has been <laughs> rife uh, and i'm in the middle of half a dozen other scripts that i've started and of course working on the series uh with uh 
uh, Natalie Arl Toyle and Martina Russo uh, about uncredited collaboratives. And I'm starting my own publishing, uh, boutique publishing house, which I'm incredibly excited about because I, I've written a series of children's books and an art, uh, the commentary to uh, a very funny and original art book. Uh, and of course my memoir, and I, I want to have artistic creative control over those projects. Uh, and I also have friends. One of them, uh, Martin Day, is, is a brilliant writer who'd written a lot of Doctor Who episodes and books about Doctor Who. And he wrote a first novel that I thought was just genius and nobody will publish it. And that, of course, I want to publish it. And I have other friends who've written it. So the idea, because I have a, a production company that I've started uh, that deals with radio and television and film projects to merge that with the the publishing house end of it uh, and to really create projects that work on multiple platforms so if you have children's books you should have animation that goes with it you should have uh, you know it should be educational material that goes with it and and it's the same for, for adult material so uh, martin's day novel called composing hallelujah uh, commissioned him. he's going to write a two-part television script for, based on that story and so it's uh, it's hugely exciting. All these years have have been uh, probably my my most uh, creatively fecund time of my my life. I I've just gotten so much writing and singing done uh, in the years fighting this case. And I think if I hadn't fought this case, if I hadn't stood up for myself, uh, I don't think I could have continued to write because it just breaks you. Yeah. So what would your, you said at the beginning, if anyone behaves like that, get out now. Get out. So what would your tips be? Let's what, what are your tips for anyone who wants to work collaborative? What are your top do's and don'ts? Oh, it's, it's so difficult because I, I said to my husband a while ago, I, was like, I would never get into this kind of situation again. And he looked at me and said, yes, you would. And, <laughs> and he's absolutely right. I, I, I have to trust people. I, I can't. I can't live without that. Uh, it's more important to me than... Well, you can trust people, but you can also protect yourself. Yes, you? absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, thank, thank God, uh, Martina Russo, who is, who is still only in her 20s, but is very grown up and serious uh, filmmaker. She's very on top of the contracts, so we have signed some seriously solid contracts uh, that will hopefully protect our... our uh, our documentary series going forward and it becomes increasingly important as, as a lot of other creative join. so you often have projects that are co-produced with other production companies and and she has had huge problems with this as, as has Natalie that when other people come on board they try to bump you and they try to uh, take you down in terms of the credit and influence that you have over, over the project so so hopefully we, we will have protected and I'm learning I'm learning about that that end of it and that uh, that very, very important aspect of it. But if I go back to my relationship with Nicholas Martin, you know, even if I had had, I started asking for contracts at the end of that relationship and he broke off all contact with me when I asked him that. That's how he, we fell out. He just stopped speaking to me. He ghosted me, uh, he cut me off completely. Uh, but um, having himself offered me 15%, which is a, a laughable amount, which the judge then ruled that I had invented all that. <laughs> but even if at the beginning we had signed contracts, what could I have done? He was the one with the agent. He was the one with the experience. And I had absolutely no idea how much of the work I would do, you know, even in that early part of the process when we were working on the treatments, I had no idea I would be as involved in the actual writing of the, of the script as I became. Um, and so it's a really, really tricky one to, to fully protect yourself, uh, with contracts that are signed before the work is created. It really should be at the end of it, you look back and everybody agrees on who did what. Uh, but egos are such that that's, that's not um, really how it works. So yes, yeah. you need yeah. contracts, you, you need yeah, them. You need, well, you need some kind of paper trail. Even if you have a simple that's contract that, agreement that says, we are going to collaborate on this, just right. make sure you keep dropping the emails in. To make sure, to what we've been make doing. sure you have it. If you're collaborating, yeah. Make sure that you have a copy of absolutely every paper uh, yeah. that gets made and, and every, yeah, abs by final draft, don't refuse to Yeah, work. well, it's not cheap, yeah. is it? It's not well, cheap. Pounds, you, what, at the time, it was 200 pounds. I remember yeah. that. 
Is well, that... I know, but if you're really scraping along, as you said at that point, you're desperate, why would you buy two copies of something that costs £200 when £200 pounds is a lot of money? Yeah, but in hindsight, so that's your other piece of advice, buy the software and make sure you have work on your own machine. The worst financial yeah. decision of my life was to save myself £200 on final draft software. Like, so stupid. If I had that to do over again, well, it's as simple as that. Yeah, the hindsight is, though, is I mean, always twenty twenty vision, isn't it? Isn't it? But the thing is, it's like you say, it's not just why would you financially, you know, why would you at the point of which you're in a in an exciting collaboration with a partner be like, I'm going to do this on my computer in my area. Exactly. You know, it's like, it's not where you're at, why is it? No, of course it's not. Yeah. And it's, it's an ongoing flow and it's a cascade of ideas and it's absolutely impossible to after the fact even though the day remember who came up with what line or that's pure fantasy it's not how it works when you're in the flow of the creation lines change 10 times in a day or you you know over years i mean my god trying to remember uh, exactly who came up with what word and it, it's impossible um, exactly and this is why I, mean, I think what you said about trust is really important because it would be impossible to collaborate with someone like that you know i'm just trying to imagine if you had said right at the outset let's just lay down a few ground rules and obviously not necessarily with the same person because we all know how i mean you you know your first attempt to do something like that um you know you, you've told the story about what happened there so but even with anybody you know i try to imagine doing something like this with my husband and if i was to say i'm just gonna get us a contract and i'm gonna do all my work on my own computer and he'd be a bit like what <laughs> you know like, are you about to sort of you know screw me over somehow and then you're the one placing this this trust level in a different place it really is very very complicated um and I really don't think that anyone who has got themselves into a situation like this or has ended up in a situation like this, I should say, um, should blame themselves at all because it is absolutely part and parcel of the trust that's needed to do something brilliant creatively. Yeah, if you don't um, trust someone, you shouldn't be collaborating with them, probably. It's funny you should, it's say, you should say that because I, I do feel it's my fault on some fundamental level i i uh i give an interview to to the marvelous journalist dominic carman whose father george carman yeah. was uh the qc in the jeremy thorpe trials who got jeremy thorpe mp off uh, and uh he wrote a book about his his father and unfortunately the interview i gave him was never published in the sunday times it was supposed to come out a few weeks ago but one of the things he said when he was reading through my witness statement he said you sound like you're apologizing throughout. Mm. And that's exactly right. He's very perceptive. That's exactly how I feel. I feel this, uh, like I, I very stupidly allowed this to happen to me. And that is, that is uh, it, it does feel like my mistake because I really should have known. I had a lot of family and friends around me who had met Nicholas Martin. They said, you're an idiot. You, you're, he's not gonna credit you with anything. What is wrong with you? And I said, you, I defended him to everyone. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, that's not so smart, is it? <laughs> no, but it's not your fault. No, it's no. not. And I think even because I caught myself just then when I said that, I said anyone who's got themselves into that situation, and I suddenly thought that has even come out of my head in my knowing how I feel about this in this narrative in this context. Is that phrase has still come out of my mouth and and you know i correct that and say that anyone who has ended up finds in this situation themselves. Yeah, finds, finds themselves it. in this situation yeah. because we did that narrative of blame is really really inbuilt and i think as the person who was trustworthy and trusting because you know i think maybe, especially for women as well yeah who is prepared to to wholeheartedly enter into a true collaboration that's yeah. always going to be the person that ends up in in a situation if one is to occur um where whether you know um being um being taken for granted having their credit removed and so on mm -hmm. and that's just, that's how it works with the um the balance of power um it's, uh... it's really you know and it's a real shame uh because collaboration it really is so much greater than the sum of its parts we one and one really does make three uh, in, in a collaborative context, there, there is, a, you know, no matter woman is an island and yeah. collaboration just creates such marvelous work. Yeah. A couple of years yeah. ago to 
a show put on by I think the wardrobe ensemble of Bristol, but education, education, education. It was just the best thing I'd seen in ages. I was just squealing with delight and they shared credit equally. It was just written. The whole show was written by everyone in the cast and it was brilliant. Yeah. And I just hope that the world moves away from the fantasy of a kind of single mastermind genius who is locked away in his room writing. That may work for novelists or, or, or literary writers, but a film is collaborative uh, by definition. The only film in which a writer, a single writer is the ultimate arbiter who decides what goes in is a film that never gets made because it sits in a drawer. Because as soon as you have producers, the director, actors, that work is going to change a lot. Before yeah, in, in the state, the Americans really got its head around this in terms of the writer's room. You know, there's, there's not a TV show that's not got, like The Simpsons, those shows, they put top writers around a table together. Yeah. And that's how you get great work. You get it by because you'll say, you know, what about this line? You know, I've done it myself on script writing. And when you've got other people there, they go, well, yeah, that's a good line. But actually, you could just shift it like this. Oh, yeah, that's even funnier. That's but, it. You bounce off each other. You yeah, bounce, you bounce off each other. Everyone comes with a different background. Everyone tweaks to add a, a slightly different element of humor. There's, it, it's ext it is, And when you're in the midst of that creative process, it is the most exhilarating thing it. ever it's absolutely gorgeous and it's it's such a, a a different thing i love sitting and writing all day myself i i actually love doing it uh, but it's a very different process from from having other other human souls uh bouncing off you it's that that's absolutely magical yeah but look what's happening i mean look at all the things you're doing now you're yeah, yeah, yeah. you know what they say living well is the best revenge totally so <laughs> This whole mess is the story of how I met my husband, and I'm exceptionally happily married now. I'm just the luckiest, jammiest bastard ever. Uh, <laughs> I'm quite right, too. Uh, well, that's right. the title. There's a film, The Luckiest, yeah. Jammiest Bastard Ever. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll oh, say thank that. God. It's all happened as it has. I, I'm so glad. I just want to, I want to squeeze the lemons of all this that, that's happened and, and make some real lemonade that, that can benefit people from this. So I was just going to say that the theft, uh, the intellectual property theft, has been the dirty little secret of the film world for a very, very long time. Everyone knows about it, and everyone knows stories of people it's happened to, and we're going to out them. It's time to talk. Thank God the Me Too movement came along. It's quite surreal in the midst of all of this. In 2018, the Me Too movement comes along, and of course, it isn't just about sex. It's about the power yeah. to take without fear of consequences. Uh, yeah. And that's yeah, that, it's, yeah, it's like Black Lives Matter as well. It's all about imbalance of power. It's, it's so, about. I know you said, you know, when life hands you lemons, make lemonade. I actually think you should squeeze it back in the bastard's eyes. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, do you know, it's, it's so funny because here, I, I keep reminding myself, there is, you know, the judge finds you a liar and all of this. How, how much does it matter? I don't think it matters very much. What does actually matter, and absolutely respective of what anyone believes or anyone asserts, is what actually happened. Yeah. That matters. And that cannot be eradicated. <laughs> and, and he knows that that's what happened. So, you know, sitting, uh, the more strongly you assert uh, someone never entered your office or wrote a word, and you know perfectly well that this was the, the stuff of daily life that this happened. Mm. Uh, you can't, uh, I, I don't think that makes for a very happy uh, yeah. life no, or exactly. life good karma. <laughs> I, I don't <laughs> think that, the, I, I'd far rather be the person who is wronged in this case. Um, mm. But I think as well, it's, um, the other thing I think is, is important, as well as what as what is right, which is extremely important, and what actually happened is the impact that it had on you and has on you. Mm. Um, and as you say, and I mean, I'm not, you know, the impact that it has on Nicholas Martin, may, I will never know, but it may be that he is permanently dissatisfied with this, and it is it is a real, you know, blight, and it certainly sounds. Whereas for you, um, yeah, let's hope so. Just, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Until we're, we're just trying to be balanced in our comments. But, yeah. <laughs> I don't really know why. Um, but anyway, <laughs> well, but, um, but what, you know, I've been, we've been working together a, a while now, Julia, and I've been aware of this case as it's gone on for, for a couple of years now. And I think, um, you know, the, 
the impact um, has it's been kind of touched upon. It's not been something we've talked about a lot in this interview. Um, of you know how it, the impact it has on you to have your intellectual property denied, to have to go to court, to have to spend money on fighting this, to to then be disbelieved or to be believed but not, you know, all of these things have an impact, don't they? And this is where I think, in a sense. Um, People, when they hear the outcome of a trial, they want to hear, you know, like a story of the underdog or the person who's in the right wins and they feel great forever. And, you know, this <laughs> the happy ending is achieved and it's all good, but it's way more complicated than that. And I think that especially um, for, for people who've been through um, something that involves, you know, coercion and emotional manipulation, yeah. um, that is not... Ne- I'm not aware of any cases in which it's like, I have reached my vindicating verdict, the world knows how great I am, everything is fine now, and the impact of that is all behind me. No, you're absolutely right, and I I, I have real sort of post-traumatic stress disorder about the whole thing, and, and I, at the time that I was in this relationship, I, I would wake up at night, you know, drenched in sweat with my heart racing, and I would wake up in the morning and I'd go through the next day as if that never happened. Um, and I know people who are in this situation will <laughs> relate to that experience. Uh, and it, it's, it's just so hard to, looking back from where I am now, to relate to the person I was back then. Uh, but if you haven't gone through it, uh, I would say it, it is very, very hard to imagine. And before I went through it, I, I, I couldn't have even imagined uh, a scenario in, in which anything like that. Yeah, because you can't help feeling I'm being judged. It's personal. I'm being judged. You know, am I believed or not? That is a judgment on you. It's not just the facts of the case. Yeah. And this, you know, in this case, it was very much. You know, it must have felt very. I would have taken that very personally. Absolutely, but to just even find yourself in a coercive relationship is such a, a, a mm. surreal. I, I, I think uh, I, I'm horrified to admit. I always thought, you know, women who stay in relationships were either. A bit weak or, or, or a bit dumb or a little bit uh, desperate or a little bit but uh, you know and 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 here's sort of karma kicking me in the pants uh for for such an ignorant uh opinion uh it, it's not like that at all you you lose yourself you lose your sense of identity you i i completely lost all track of of what was real what wasn't it there's a, there was a kind of switcheroo with this this living this dual reality and and defending it, you know, I, I defended Nicholas Martin as, as an author. I, uh, I I participated in the hoax of it, uh, even as I was working with him um, daily. I, I wrote uh, I wrote letters to producers, directors on his behalf, and he just signed his name to them. I, you know, and then and then turned around and claimed in court that that uh, he had to keep control of me with the production team because. I, I would go crashing about <laughs> with people, and I mean, it just uh, uh, it, it's you know, someone who believes they have the power to reinvent you and basically create narrative of any kind and fully expect to be believed uh, is really it's absolutely incredible. And it's funny you have the the Trump pre- presidency happening at the same time, and you see someone. Exactly, you know, with these character traits, and I just couldn't even look at Trump. I should have switched the news to a different channel. I can't watch it because it's just too familiar. Um, it really is uh, incredible that reality can be disputed in that it way. It is. You know, I, I only became aware of gaslighting as a concept relatively recently, kind of since I had my son in the context of, of gaslighting of children, which is um, completely unforgivable and happens all the time. Um, and uh, and since then, so only within the last couple of years or so, I've been, any time I encounter gaslighting, the more I think it is actually possibly one of the worst kinds of abuse that can possibly yeah. be. I mean, obviously, yeah. you know, within reason. Yeah, but yeah, it is, it, because it is um, it's tantamount to anything. If there's an alternative re- reality, anything can happen. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. It's someone literally taking your soul away from you, your reality, your yeah, perception, yeah. and saying, that didn't happen. And your truth. And your truth and your trust in yourself. Yeah. Okay. You become a liar unto yourself. And that's. That is exactly. Yeah. It, it, it felt like I joined a cult. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
exactly that. Yeah. Mm. And on that cheerful note. Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> But oh my gosh. you live to fight, well, yes, but you've lived to fight another day. Um, <laughs> Rears <laughs> comes for us all. <laughs> well, as I say, I am, I am grateful, enormously grateful that you've come and talked to us about, about this. Thank and it's, so it's very, very important. And I'm yeah. delighted to hear that there's going to be a documentary series. Um, yeah. Because it's in a fantastic story. I mean, we don't diminish your pain, but it's a fantastic story. Mm. It is, you know, I mean, it's a painful one, but it's a great story. I, I um, hope it will serve some kind of purpose. Yeah, yeah yes. absolutely. I hope that um, that it will as well. And for me, the biggest, possibly one of the biggest things is, is this, un I always feel like there's two narratives. There's the story that everyone sees, and then there's the story... Uh, without wishing to be again like a sort of um, a generalist about gender, but that's the story that the women see, or the the people who've experienced things on a different level yeah. see things, and uh, you know, like the family judge that you mentioned. And I just think, again, this has been my experience since my son's been born, in particular, and I'm I think that I'm extremely privileged not to have seen it before then. Um, that this is like the underbelly of what people actually go through and how people yeah. actually experience things. And it seems mm -hmm. um, that that is, is not well understood in the legal system at all or in, in, in many industries, either film, music. Yeah. And, the most uh, shocking thing about it is how common it is. Mm, yeah, absolutely. It's dead common. Yeah. yeah. And especially in the creative industries that are so hierarchical and, and people are uh, part of, especially in, in something like film and television, it, there's so so much smoke and mirrors involved. There's this kind of fantasy that you have to be very special, uh, magical in some way mm. to be part of those industries. If you're an actor, you have talent that other people don't yeah. have. You know, if you're a writer, and therefore you can do whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, if you're Harvey Weinstein, yeah. Mm, nice. And that that kind of that the that figment of imagination that's necessary in the in the pushing of celebrity culture of exclusivity of any kind which yeah. is mm. i i detest the word yeah. even exclusive what does it mean any human being can tell a story everyone is worthy of telling their story what does any of it mean i know loads yeah. of people with fantastic theatrical talents my husband who's a ceo of a big company like you know there are people who have these talents who are not in the business and the people who are in the business who have these talents are no more special than people in any other business and i i, I would like to just take a little pinprick to the balloon of the entire idiocy of it uh and just go yeah uh, and, along, parallel to that is always who has the power and exactly. therefore they have the credibility with power goes credibility and that's, that's dangerous yeah. i think that's the that's the one of the dangerous and yeah. you know abuse that's that's how abuse can happen yes and, and men yeah. start out with credibility so yeah, they this start is out something with i've noticed yeah. women have to battle for it but with yeah. men it's kind of baseline given oh look a great new talent you know has come along and he's immediately there's a sense of of solidity whereas with a woman you that that is that is not at all a given uh, that that's my sense. Maybe I'm wrong, and I hope no, I, I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. That's not what it feels like. It feels like the the, the ground assumption is that you haven't got it. And I think it boils. I think that that in in many cases is it. You know that what you mentioned about somebody. You know, Nicholas challenged you when you asked for a co a co credit, and you reacted by saying, "Oh, I must make this easier for him." Yes. <laughs> Yeah. And that is a very yeah. uh, generally feminine way to deal with conflict. Yes. Um, very, I think we've all, I've certainly been there multiple times, you know, that um, mm. that like, oh, okay, I've overstepped. I need to yes. rein it in exactly. and make this, and it's all for the good of the project and the best possible thing it could be. And, you know, because we, you know, we care about that more than we care about our own autonomy within it. Um, it totally. And you say, someone's upset with me. Uh, to me, oh, an explanation yeah. that I've hurt someone's feelings or have made someone feel upset in some way is devastating. I can't bear the thought of that because I, I really, yeah. you know, making people around me happy is matters more to me than anything else. Uh, and people use that against you, which is very, very sad. Uh, you know, my husband, I watch, he's quite extraordinary because 
he handles so many problems and so many conflicts and conflict really upsets me and he's it's just extraordinary how well he handles it and he doesn't really mind who who he upsets he's unfailingly kind and empathetic but it never crosses his mind that he should be particularly devastated if someone is you know uh upset by something he said uh when it's perfectly fair it's it's yeah. women very, are raised very differently. Uh, it's highly gendered this as well because I've encountered a few women recently who are going out of their way to not try to be liked, and they are. It is a fear. Yeah. It is very. Um, they behave very differently to the majority of women, mm-hmm. like very differently, and it's it's very kind of you're kind of like oh, okay. Um, <laughs> And yeah. I kind of love it, and, and and then I sometimes wonder whether it shouldn't be more that men should try to be like more rather than you know. No. Yeah. yeah, I don't know, um, no. but yeah, it's 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 definitely yeah. very interesting. I, I feel like we could carry on talking this yes. through. Yes, well, this is infinitely fascinating, uh, and and how much that that is part of the upbringing and the and I was uh, in the so I had some couple years when I was, uh, my singing career hadn't taken off and I was staying at home raising my, my little kids and I, I started doing a transfer degree that I never finished uh, because I won a singing competition, my career did take off, uh, but I was doing a, a degree in developmental child psychology, which I am, am absolutely fascinated by and there have been quite a few studies about exactly this and, you know, parents do react so differently uh, to girls and boys and they don't realize they're doing it. Absolutely, it's, it's absolutely. very profound. It's, it's, it's very, very deep. Yeah, yeah absolutely. As a, as a mother of a son as well, I'm I'm acutely aware of this, and I think the um, the movement for empowering girls started a little earlier than the movement for adjusting toxic masculinity in boys. But yeah. I feel lucky actually to be raising a son at the point at which both sides are fairly. It's not very mainstream, but it's not difficult to find people who who are aware of it and um, and who it matters to. If you see what I mean, yeah. Um, but I, it I, is I, a challenge. There's no way that I don't have behaviour with my son that that perpetuates the gender imbalance. There's no. no well, question. boys boys are higher on the aggressiveness scale and lower on agreeableness. This is an actual physiological difference between boys and girls. However much we would care to deny it and I remember watching my son's playing with my friend's daughter and you know they would all build these towers of Legos and my boys would smash them up and she would come and get them all off and build them <laughs> oh my god oh god and isn't that isn't that classic Did you see the future stretching out in front of her <laughs> yeah when they get to be teenagers they get their own back then they come in oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's no easier than my boys. <laughs> um, yeah, lovely. All right, no, I think we should round this up. It's been it's, it's yeah. so completely Gosh. fascinating. Um, thank you so much. It's been no, a real, real you, pleasure. Julia. Thank you, Margaret and Julia, for for coming on. And thank you so much, Julia, yeah, for sharing Julia. this story with us. My pleasure. Thank you. Goodbye. Yeah. Bye. Bye. What an incredible story. We've covered so much here, it's hard to know how to sum up what we've just heard. I know you will share our admiration for Julia and her courage in fighting for her right to be acknowledged for her creative contribution to the Florence Foster Jenkins screenplay, and how her own behaviour in trying to maintain her relationship at the time ultimately worked to her disadvantage. That's a story that will resonate with so many women. You can't help also admiring how positive she is in the face of the trauma of the trial and the personal disappointment in how she was treated in the course of giving evidence against her former partner and how she has such exciting plans for her writing and publishing career. If you want to find out more about Julia as both a singer and a writer and specifically about the Florence Foster Jenkins case, you can find this on her website www.juliacogan.com. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Music Works podcast. If you've enjoyed this conversation, please subscribe, check out our other great episodes and even better, leave us a review. You can also sign up to our mailing list at www.polyphonyarts.com forward slash mailing dash list 
for updates and news about what Polyphony Arts is up to for all you classical music folk out there. You can find more information in the show notes as well. Meanwhile, I'm Katie Beardsworth and I look forward to sharing with you the next great episode of Music Works. Music Works is generously supported by Allianz Musical Insurance, the UK's number one musical instrument insurer. Allianz Music Insurance, serving the music community since 1960, proud to be the insurer of choice for over 70,000 musicians. Music Works is a Polyphony Arts production. Thank you for listening. Thank you.